Hey, what's <laughs> going on, everybody? <clears throat> Howie Spangler here at Sales from the Green Room. Uh, what's up, Vinny? How's it going, man? We got we got Vinny Fiorello here from uh, Less Than Jake, and uh, you're going to tell me about the new band, and I want to hear about Fuel by Rom, and I want to hear about all this great stuff. Man, you know, uh, well, I guess we could start with the new stuff and then work our way backwards. Does that make sense, right? Let's do that. Let's do okay. it. Anyway, you want. Uh, so uh, today, uh, randomly speaking, this will play on another day, but we're recording it today. It's on a Tuesday. The following Monday from now, uh, I'll be basically, uh, it'll be the debut of the first song that I've been a part of since kind of uh, leaving the, the Jake world behind and, and not touring and things like that. And we'll get there too, but... Uh, I'll be launching the inevitables and the inevitables came about with a conversation about an idea that I had with OB Fernandez from Westbound train. And, uh, I wanted to do a simultaneous release between, uh, a comic book and then the soundtrack for that comic book. So we assembled a, a cast of players as well as a script writer to do the comic book. And we'll be launching the Kickstarter, uh, next Monday. Uh, and that, that's a cool vibe for me. It's called the inevitables and players on that, uh, would be, uh, myself, Obi Fernandez from Westbound train, Alex Stern from big D and the kids table in the pomps, uh, Billy cottage from the interrupters, Matt Appleton from real big fish, uh, John, do you, Dia De Michi from uh, Jeff Rosenstock Band and Bomb the Music Industry, uh, as well as singing on it is uh, this guy, Sean Paul Pillsworth from uh, Nightmares for a Week, which is punk band, kind of Americana punk band from upstate New York. And I fell in love with his voice. I put out a seven inch, uh, a split seven inch actually from his band and fell in love with his voice and his just overall vibe. So uh, I'm glad that he's singing on it, but, uh, we started working on it in November, man, and kind of built the world and wrote the songs, me and Obi and Alex, and we did it remotely, which is crazy to me, you know? And then as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, it was okay, well, we've been doing it remotely anyway, so let's just continue the arc. So everything that, uh, is being recorded and being mixed. Uh, it's all done uh, remotely by the players that are involved, which is wild. But it also shows you how far technology has gone, man. Dude, that's incredible. I love this. It's so it's like a it's a a, a project full of all stars. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, there's some 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 good names there, man. Yeah, and, he heavy uh, hitters. Heavy hitters, great players. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt and Billy alone are just insane. Um, yeah, man. And uh, the fact that we can do it this way now, it's, you know, we, me and my guys, we recorded our last record pretty much remotely, yeah. you know, like um, Donald does drums at his house. There's bass and keys everywhere else. And then they all fly over to me via Dropbox because fuck Google Drive. <laughs> and, and I just throw it all together here and it's done. It's it's what use lander to master it. <laughs> You're yeah, done. Man. Yeah, it, dude. It, it, it's it's a wild time because before, I mean, even let, let's even go with probably four years ago, five years ago, it would have been impossible to do it like well, you're doing it and how we're doing it. Uh, so for me, uh, it just continued to go along. So even during the pandemic, uh, we were gearing up to go and record all in one place, but we're just just kept on the arc of doing it remotely. Man, it, you know it's it, it's crazy, and it's it's so it's so inexpensive now. I won't say it's cheap, but it's inexpensive. You yeah, know, man. Get the sounds you want, you know, as opposed to uh, I, I was just listening to uh, uh, some of the um, of Chris to Make's podcast with Howard Benson uh, yeah. this morning when I was working, and um, saying how you guys were like the f one of the first rock bands on Pro Tools. Absolutely. You could hear it a little bit too. You know, like if you go back and listen to it, you're like, yeah, there, there, there's some spots that you could hear that we were first generation on that, you know, right on. but, but Howard Benson was an early adopter for it. So when he came in, uh, we were 
are, you know, slack jawed would be the word when he was like, we got this thing, it's called Pro Tools. I can extend this note and I can, you know, do all this other stuff. And we we're like, dude, this is, this is, we've hit the future, man. This is crazy. I'm a, I'm a big uh, advocate for, for tech and um, <clears throat> embracing it. You know, like I feel like when you fight the future, you it's like futile you know yeah um it's it's losing it's always a losing thing man you have to you have to embrace the future you have to embrace it uh you know and and you are going to get left behind um and so having the foresight guy like howard benson to 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 run with it when it was you know in its infancy um you know he's i was i was listening how he was like cla was like what the fuck is this what is what is this This is ridiculous you know where's the mixing console where's the you know um that that's i don't know but obviously chris lord has jumped on board since then but um i love it man the fact that we can do it this way just over the cloud if you want to call it that yeah um and uh all it takes is uh is a little bit of gear knowledge and a little professionalism you know and and you can have a great record a great yeah set. Well, here's the, here's the thing that I always, you know, we we've done uh, tours, you know, you know, myself and yourself, uh, Ballyhoo and, and Less Than Jake, in the past. And the thing that I always appreciated about you and the band, you always were working, always hustling. Whether it be, hey, I'm gonna do this, you know, acoustic vibe on YouTube. I'm gonna do the podcast that we're on right now, and it's a constant hustle of a a playlist or a Spotify you know, sort of moment of trying to get more playlist on it. I always respected the hustle, but when you have technology and then you have a good work ethic on top of all of that, that's when you're truly capitalizing on the forward momentum of technology and you're using your forethought and hard work. You have to have that hard work, right? And mm-hmm. and you can really, you know, uh, take advantage of it. Absolutely, man. I'm a, <clears throat> I'm always like... You know, when when the iPhone came out and, and uh, probably, I don't know, just a couple generations in when uh, GarageBand was available, oh, I was yeah. like, oh, my God, what can I do with this? What kind of damage can I do? That's what I do when I when I look at yeah, right. I see a new tech. And, and, and if I can kind of visualize the things that I can do with it, you know, like I'm, I'm like, I feel like I'm ahead of the game, you know. Yeah, man. I, I think that, you know, I, for a long time I was doing, you know, daily skulls, right. And then it progressed into other things besides skulls, but I've wound up doing maybe, I think a little over 1100 skulls, right. Yeah, they're sick. And, and, and people go, well, how, how do you do that? And I uh, hold up my iPhone. I go, it's, I do it all right here on my iPhone. They're like, how do you do it? I go, dude, it's just on a simple, like sort of design program. Uh, it's not Photoshop, and it's just this thing called Memo Pad, and I just do it. And I think that you can use it and manipulate technology enough, and you can even break technology to like make it succumb to like get glitchy. And that's a beautiful thing too, right? Like you can bend it and break it if it's a simple enough technology, and use it to your advantage to do something fresh with. Absolutely, man. I, I, I can relate that to recording as well. So like back in the day when, when I, you know, I've seen a bunch of tutorial videos, I've never personally worked in, in like a full analog setting, like mixing and things like that. Um, but when you hear about these guys, yeah, we used to work on analog desks and, uh, and what happens is you, there's these harmonics that are like specific to that desk, you know, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> just because of the analog with the circuitry and stuff and uh harmonics and a little distortion things um things like that well with digital it's so clean it's like i like to add lo-fi and like weird i like to push things and make them sound distorted anyway to kind of get a little bit of that that fatness and rawness grittiness back so i love the idea of being able being able to manipulate the technology and to kind of make it work for you you know in whatever way possible yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing, man. And you're you're only limited by what your imagination is, man. If you could see the end, then you could do anything to get to the end. You know, if I wasn't using my phone to do skulls, then it would be, you know, picking up garbage off the street and making like a skull collage, whatever it is. Like, if there's a means to an end, and you could see it, and you want to do it, and you want to put the work in, like, dude, it's an endless 
it's an endless thing, man. Like your creativity could go leaps and bounds. You just have to put the work in, man. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of people fall short. You know, there's people that are creative um, and they want to do things, but they either don't just don't know how to do it, don't know where to start. And my my thing for that is like just start, just start yeah, man. doing it. That's how, like people ask all the time, like how how did you get to do it? How did you start the podcast? I, I just started doing it. You know, like oh. I don't. I wasn't so concerned about. I I am like I do want it there to be, which does inhibit me sometimes the perfect cover art or like it needs to sound great or it needs to look great. That doesn't inhibit me sometimes. I'm trying to let go of that over time, but ultimately just start doing it and it'll get better as you go. You'll learn, go yeah. back and listen to what you did, watch what you did and fix it, adjust and move forward. And um, so they either don't know how to do it or people are just too lazy to go do what they want to do. You know, it's true. It's it's just like, you know, if you want to see things through, you have to take it into your own hands and you can't wait for others, you know? Yeah. You know, I think you're right in that. I think that uh, the big thing is just starting, number one. And I think other than that, and, and you touched on it again, sometimes you have to just launch when it's not 100%, learn the lessons, and then strive to make it 100%. You know, it's... There's always, you know, a, uh, it's kind of kind of a memory that I have that I continue on with it. And uh, I had done a lot of uh, bobbleheads and different toys f with Funko, right? And Funko does pops and things that you may know of and people may go see it at Target or whatever. But early on, it was bobbleheads, right? And uh, Mike Becker, who owned it at the time and started the company, he told me this in passing once. He goes... Sometimes you just have to leave it so there's room to grow. Sometimes you don't want to try to like pin it and go, this is the best that it could possibly be and pin it to the roof because sometimes that's just like you'll chase that forever, right? And sometimes just having room to grow is the best thing that you can do. And it doesn't have to be always 100%, but it just has to feel good to you and then just move on and let it grow naturally to that 100% organically. I, I, that always sails in the back of my brain, man, that it's okay to launch at 85%. Yeah. Yeah, man. The, the, I like, I like seeing the flaws and I like, uh, you know, learning from the mistakes and um, how to make things better. Uh, when, when it's something that, you know, when, when it's like a song, when you're like writing a song and you've recorded it and it's out, um, I wouldn't say that's out of the window because you can always, you know, could do a, a new version later or, yeah. or do an acoustic version and do something different. Um, but when it's something that's like this, where it's like continual and there's many like episodes, you know, like a podcast or whatever, or, or you're making videos on YouTube, you know, you, you can, uh, you're able to, to do that. You're able to apply that, like grow it out. Like how can I make this better over time? You know? Um, okay. and, uh, like I was saying to someone earlier today, um, the, uh, the podcast, they were asking me about the podcast. I was like, you know, when I started the podcast, I, like the first 10 or 20 episodes, I had some random uh, stock art from the internet, just a row of palm trees and a sunset. And I thought it was dope. It matched the visual style I wanted. But, you know, it was like a stock thing. And, and, even the photographer like messaged me like, bro, that's my art. I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry to get You know, I'll, take, I'll change it. He said, no, 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 it's a royalty free thing. It's fine. I just thought it was cool that you used it. Um, but I did that because I just wanted to get something out. I want, I was tired of waiting. I was ready to put it out. Let me go on, on online and find a stock free photo for the cover. And then, you know, 10, 20 episodes in, I finally designed my own thing and put it up. So when you go back and you'll see those old episodes, they'll have that cover art. Um, yeah. I love that. When I when the first few episodes of me, just from two years ago talking, I'm like, God, I sound like an idiot, you know? <laughs> and, and like, there's so many uhs and ums and I still have that, but I feel like I've gotten better over time. I can hear it. Um, whereas the general listener is going to not think anything of it. Yeah. But you know, that's just going to happen. I, I love it, man. The progression, uh, the growth. Um, and I'm thinking of all these other things that I can do, you know, now it's like, totally. <laughs> it's, I've, I've tried different things on my YouTube channel. Like I do the song of the day I've done vlogging. I've done, um, green day covers, you know, on guitar, like just because I love green day, insomniac's my favorite album. So it's like, 
I don't care if anybody, if I get two views, I'm just going to do this because I love this band and I'm going to do this, you know? Um, it, it's a, uh, and, and no, they don't get the most views. Actually, the song of the day gets the most views. So it's, it's just, I don't know, man. I just found that like, you can look, it's also free R and D. You get to see what works best if you sure. try a bunch of things. And then once you figure it out, you start whittling it down and you, you double down on that content, you know? Yeah. You know, it's when I had stopped touring, I always liked doing art and i always kind of like doodled around like i said like did the skull of the day thing for a really long time uh but i found that when i had more free time i got into design uh more and uh that led me just to you know continually to work and now do commercial work whether it be for you know a brewery or whether it be for other bands uh it goes beyond just Hey, this is my personal work and I feel it, but it's led me down another path to just do graphic artwork commercially, you know, and, and that's a cool feeling as well. But I wouldn't have known that if I just hadn't started to do like, oh yeah, I, I feel like doing this and expressing myself visually. So uh, that led me to do one thing, which led me to do another, which led me to do another and relearn some old things, right? But just expand that palette for expressing myself, whether it be, you know, uh, lyrics or whether it be, uh, I just released a book called 619, whether it's that, uh, whether it's uh, visual art on a personal level, visual art on a commercial level, dude, I, I just want to have all those tools to express myself. Yes. Yes. I, <clears throat> I'm constantly trying to find ways to express myself. Um, you know, even back in high school, as nerdy as this is, wanting to read my report in front of people, in front of the class, you know, I mean, it's so dorky and nerdy, but I, I want to go, you know, <clears throat> but like, um, it's a way for you to get it out. And so the podcast was a way for me to express another, in another medium, um, my thoughts. And I figured I could give my my experience, my knowledge from, from being in a band for 25 years now, uh, and just in the touring and recording and co shitty contracts and all the things, I feel like there's some value to that. And yeah. there has been value. I see people message me all the time and they're wearing the, the podcast t-shirt now and like coming to me at the shows when we, when we used to play shows, I don't know if you remember that or not. <laughs> uh, so you know, coming to me at the merch table saying like, dude, I love the podcast. It's, it's, it's like helping me. Even if they're not an artist, they're getting entertainment from it. And it also, they get some insight into what it is to be, you know, a touring artist. Um, yeah. and it was a way for me to get all that out. Uh, the next thing, I think the next thing for me is, uh, probably selling my art, which I've gotten some messages about that, um, recently, and then writing a book. Uh, that's yeah. probably my next thing. And the book is going to be very, I'm going to do it by myself. So it's going to be very plain and not too clever. It's <laughs> direct thoughts, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, I thought it'd be a cool thing for people to get inside my mind. Um, but yet another way for me to express my artistry. And, that's, and, and not only that, on top of all that, you're, you know, sort of on that creative aspect of it and that's cool, but it's also, if you think about it on the business side, it's just another, like, little, you know, trickle of income that comes in to make a bigger picture. Right. Yes. And I think that's important. I think that at some musicians are, I'm okay being a musician and I don't want anything else. This fulfills me 100%. But I always sit down and talk with younger bands and go, you should always think about another income stream, no matter what it is. It doesn't even have to be related to music, but if your dad knows a trade, which like a woodworker dude that I know, like his dad uh, taught him how to do that when he was young. And now he's making guitars and making drums uh, outside of what the band dynamic that he's in. Right. And I think that's important, man. I think that like, if you can make a living being creative, then you should. And if that means being a producer or putting out other people's records or a manager, you know, write books or, you know, uh, present art for people to purchase or do commercial art, whatever it is. I think that's super important in this day and age. You have to do that. hundred percent. I think, uh, I think the idea of, um, multiple revenues uh, and passive income is not a new thing, but it's certainly 
the that idea has grown and gotten more popular. Yeah, the the I, the idea of passive income has always been there as long as people have been renting property, right? Like, right. and right. that just is what it is. But I think passive income uh, started to gain traction inside the music community. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that it jumped the shark when you had, you know, very popular musicians going. I, I have a, a beverage company. I have, you know, a, a t-shirt company. You go back maybe about 15 years, you started to see it really ramp up. And even from smaller bands to huge artists. And uh, it, it's important to have that, uh, especially now. We're in COVID, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we both said before this started, uh, how you doing? I, I'm as busy as I've ever been, you know? And same for me. And I think that's because just shows that there's a lot of irons in the fire outside of the touring world of what people see. It's certainly uh, as as awful as it's been, you know, and it's all how you look at it, I guess. It has really exposed some some wonderful things. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of potential. Uh, I don't. I don't think. I think the live stream. Live streaming has been here for several years, um, probably over a decade, but it's we're only seeing the beginning of something great. I think, I think it's really ramping up and is now going to be when things get back to normal, it's not going away. It's going to be a component to the tour, to an album release to, well, if albums are still a thing, right. Yeah. Um, a single release, whatever <clears throat> bands can, uh, not now that fans have been sort of groomed and conditioned to, uh, uh, know that they can support and by donating to, to their artists, um, you know, bands are going to be using this, using live streams pre tour to raise money for a bus or, uh, you know, a rental vehicle or raise money for hotels in, in ways it's going to be used in ways that, that we never did it before. Um, and, uh, online merch, like I know for us, our online merch store, uh, sales have been going crazy because we're not at the shows doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, now, it's probably going to level out when we get back to touring. So you may not sell as much of the show. Your merch guy might not be as happy because they're not getting as big of a cut, but you're, you're, you're making it up on the online side and people are so used to just paying for things online now. You know, I feel like yeah. there's a lot of things that are being exposed in, in, in the best way. Um, I'm excited for the future. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, the, the issue that's at hand, I think, you have early on when, when, you know, the economy shut down and everyone said, okay, we're going to go home. We're going to re work remotely. We're not going to go out. Your favorite places and your favorite things to do are gone, right? Uh, people really mobilized and said, okay, we're going to play on Instagram. We're going to play on Facebook Live. We're going to do these things. But the issue is like, uh, uh, for me, there was so much of that and there's so much static that now when the waters receded, there's this digital scarcity that allows you to come out and people go, okay, well, now that I don't have a thousand things to, to choose from on a daily basis, now I can really, okay, I'm okay putting my money towards this live stream. I'm okay putting my money towards uh, this mail order, this project, whatever it is. Uh, but it takes that digital scarcity to really solidify it being economically viable. Right. right. When right. there's a thousand mm -hmm. things and they're all free, uh, then people are like, it's going to be free forever. But once those waters recede and it only happens once in a while, people are willing to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it's definitely uh, the, the, the live stream, the performance full band thing, um, you know, viewership and, you know, monetary like donations and merch sales are certainly normalizing. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, back in March, when we first did it and bands were first doing this, um, you know, bands are making 10 to 20 K on, on donations Yeah, <clears throat> because wow. the fans were like the, the, the fans saw what was happening, you know, and, and we were making us think about all, all the bands were saying like, God, holy shit. We're like, we just lost work for who knows how long this is what we do. So the fans rallied together and just started throwing money at us, you know? because they 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 care um and now it's normalizing and you know pe some people haven't worked for a while some people yeah. are unemployment they can't afford to just throw out money like that um so there's this bit of a, there was a bit of a novelty thing in, in the beginning like everything new that happens so now it's normalizing 
Um, and I'm happy to do it for free, man. I, that, that's the thing, you know, it's, I think after a while, it's like, you, you know, you can, you can be, we're, we're lucky to be in a place where, you know, we've done the numbers where we're going to be, we're going to be good for the rest of the year. Um, so long as we can keep this much money coming in things like that. Um, but I don't push too hard for donations in the beginning, you know, March, April, we were like pretty like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? Let's, we need it. We need something to, uh, a nest egg to sit on for a bit, but, but we're lucky enough to have a huge catalog. We got a bunch of videos out there on YouTube, things that are passive income that we yeah. created over time. That's why I stress bands to like <clears throat> release things all the time, but just keep going. Just don't think about it. That, that one and a half, two year album cycle is over. It's been over. Yeah. You need to release every month, two months at the most single, whatever, get your, grow your catalog, go on YouTube. You've got to be these days, you know, <laughs> well, I'm starting to go off on a tangent these days. It, people get, people stick to, they cling to tradition. Um, and like the recorded album is what, like 70 years old, like the full album yes. roughly. And that was, be, that became the norm. And it was like, for me, and certainly for people that are like, you know, 25 and under, <clears throat> like they don't, they don't really care about albums as much, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a part of just the, the natural progression of things. Um, you know, we, we switched to MP3s in like, Oh three, you know, is when, when iTunes came out, like, and really got a hold of it after Napster, Napster shook everything up. Um, and I feel like clinging to, to tradition is going to be a downfall for a lot of people, a lot of artists, um, yeah. new artists, not so much because this is just what they're used to. But anybody that like you and I, that are from the nineties, they're doing this stuff. Um, we have to sort of unlearn that and, and learn the new music industry. Um, and I feel like, and you've, you've run a label for years, so you can definitely tell me what you think about this. But, <clears throat> um, I think that, uh, you know, um, you need to keep releasing the streaming has leveled the playing field in a way that you have to make more noise. Um, and the best shit's going to stick out. Uh, and so the only way to create more noise and to stay in the conversation is to release things frequently six to eight weeks for a single or whatever. Um, if you release an album every two years, it's like, that's forever, you know? Yeah. Well, you're in a conversation for, you know, uh, three or four months, and then it becomes a touring conversation after that. Right. 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 Uh, you know, I, I have two mindsets on that because I think <clears throat> that your thought on it where, you know, it's a single based release schedule and you're sort of in that vibe that works for some bands i think that for punk rock music mm -hmm. uh it, it's hard to work it into that because the listener still likes the album experience the, sure. you know the vinyl record and and that and you could get there with that and i have no doubt that you can kind of uh dribble out singles you know three singles first and then drop the record that those singles are on which i i i in the back of my brain always go back to on the inevitable thing is what we're going to do as well. You know, by the time you can hear the full record, which will be at the end of October, we'll be three singles deep on digital platforms, right? Cool. Before you could hear the full thing. Right. Right. So uh, I agree 100%. I think that there's always, you need a fluidity no matter what in business. Right. So mm -hmm. if, and you said it earlier, when you see something that's working, and you whittle it down and then you go, you know, uh, you concentrate of what's working and then you just keep on picking at that. Right. Right. Until that moment where it changes again and then you have to change with it or at least try it. Yeah. You have, you have to be open. Um, and so <clears throat> I, I just recently uh, have, have really wrapped my mind around this because, you know, like I said a few minutes ago, like <clears throat> I'm. I, we, we had that nineties, two thousands mentality of releasing, uh, for years. And I, in a way that I think it was kind of our, to our detriment where I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening so much with Spotify and stuff like that. You know, let's say 2013, <clears throat> 2014. And, um, uh, I'm not saying that the album is dead. Uh, I, as an artist, I like the idea of having, you know, your theme with the cover art and a collection of songs, 10 or 12 songs that flow together. 
<clears throat> um, and and uh, I still think there's value to that. And I think yeah. your listeners, like your big fans, love that. That, like you said, they love having the vinyl, looking at the artwork. I'm totally for that. I think in the scheme of like, uh, you know, uh, business and staying in the conversation, we do have to adopt the, uh, you know, dropping the singles. And and there, look, and there is a point where, and I got a perfect example of this, where um, so there, there's a new technique. And I'll try to make this short. There's a new technique that a lot of artists are using um, for the last year, two years that I've noticed, and we've been doing it, uh, is that you release your single, right? And then the next single, you release the second single, uh, right? But you take the that previous single and stack it underneath it. So you only promote the new single or uh, whatever's coming out, but it has the previous single there. Third single, same thing. Take the previous two, put them under. It's like stacking. It's like a waterfall. So what this does is two things uh, for your for your fans. It might be a little bit confusing. I just think it's going to it's going to be something that's adopted more and it's going to become they're going to be more used to it. But it puts everything in one place. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not like driving and backing up. Oh, there's the first thing. Oh, where's the other single? It's all in one place um, for the artist. It's more of a strategy for generating more streams where if they, you, you promote the new song and then they it just plays through to the next one and, and the next one, the more you stack up. So you generate more streams. This also takes those previous songs. Now, you don't know what's happened in the last six months since the first single and say you've got three or four out now and they're all there together. You probably got some new fans in the last six months that haven't dug into your catalog yet, and they'll go, "Oh shit, this song's been out for six months. They didn't know about it." That's a good thing. Um, Absolutely. The other thing is that uh, it it puts all the songs back up in your top five, top ten on Spotify. Um, you generate you generate new life for for your previous singles, and so uh, where this gets funny is that you know you can keep doing that we were going to keep doing that fuck it let's take the songs off from the last year and put them on one thing because it's basically like a a, a greatest hits record or whatever you want to call yeah. it um let's get back you know take it back for a second we used to give out cds for free with five or six songs on them hey you need to listen to these songs check out our band that's essentially what we're doing here yeah. um and but at like 26 minutes or 27 minutes duration, maybe a little less, I got I got to look at the number on Spotify and Apple Music and iTunes, it categorizes that as an album. Mm -hmm. So no longer do you have a single or an EP, suddenly you have an album and you're confusing the shit out of your fans. Oh fuck, you got an album, but I've already heard these songs. So there was a little bit of that with our new release. And that's where we learned. I was like, okay, well, I guess it's album number eight. So it was like, a, it was a surprise album <laughs> and the fans. Uh, so that's something that we learned and I'm not mad about it as an artist. I'm like, yeah, it kind of messes with my artistry a little bit, you know, how I wanted it presented, but I, I like, I love the cover art. It, you know, why not? These are great songs, album number eight, whatever. So now I know, so maybe, maybe we do this waterfall thing up to five or six songs. And then on the seventh single, start it over again one and then two and then three you know and then who knows there, i think i guess what i'm getting at is there are many ways now that we can release it's not just traditional couple singles here's an album you know what i mean yeah man i mean and i think that there's always been a uh, option i just think people were so trained by our trainers right yeah. like you have to remember like there was a walled garden in the 90s of distribution yeah. Like no one knew how to get distribution. It was just something that you tried to do. You didn't know, but I think the great like, you know, neutralizer and energizer for music was opening up for just, you know, opening up distribution digitally to anyone. Right? So, you didn't have to go to the key master and go, "Can you get us in X store or online for XYZ?" Now you could sit in the comfort of your own home and you could upload it to the dashboard and that disseminates it across all of the digital platforms. And it's a beautiful thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, my policy, just to go back to what you're saying now uh, for the inevitables and for future releases that I'm doing through Paper and Plastic, it's the record has three singles before the full album comes out. So the person will see the art, understand it's a record, but it'll be that cascading waterfall of songs. 
first single, and that'll be the first and second single, and it'll be that new single, and then the first and second single below yes. it, and then the new record, the rest of the tracks will come out, right? Yes. And I think that that makes sense because you have people who had downloaded that one single, but now other things are popping in to where they had downloaded it, you know, or pre-saved it or whatever it is, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a great way to have a fan and continually enlighten them on you releasing music. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and th this model also, uh, I forgot to mention, and you may know this, but this could be, this could be good for listeners. I think this is great advice, um, <clears throat> is that every time you release a single, so with Spotify, Spotify is the leading, let's, let's be honest with this, yeah. right? Playlisting, things like that. You got to use, make sure you have your Spotify artist uh, page in place mm -hmm. uh, for your, your um, behind the scenes shit and back end. And use the Spotify submit tool, get on release radar. So, so what happens is you use release radar every time you have a single. Well, if you put out an album, you get one chance to do that. If you break up the album into singles, let's say you break it into six singles and then you drop the record, you get six chances to get on release radar, which will happen every time. There's, there's a guarantee. As long as you're seven, you submit seven days before the release date, uh, which you should be submitting way longer before that. But <clears throat> you will definitely get on release radar. And that's why I say, don't worry about monthly listeners. Worry about uh, followers. Get your followers up. Because what happens is, Ballyhoo just hit 80,000 followers on Spotify. Now, every time we put a single out and we submit, our, it goes to release radar of all 80,000 people that follow us. And anyone that didn't listen that first week, it actually gets a second bump in the second week on the release radar again. Um, and I think people still don't really know about release radar and discover weekly and things. Um, so think about that. It's like you get a chance every time to get on release radar and get more streams from that. And you get a chance to uh, get in front of the curators uh, with your submission. Yeah, man. Possibly get on a playlist. Whereas if you do it on, on an album with like 12 songs or whatever, you get one shot. You, only, you can only submit one song. Yeah, but play, play, playlist it should be the, the number one priority for all new artists or for all young artists, right? Totally. Uh, I, I think that uh, that's how you get in front of eyes and ears, man. Like you're there, you're there because of, you know, let's say it's, you know, pop punk or ska punk daily, or, you know, like uh, new, new ska punk or whatever it's called. Yep. Right. Uh, those people are, are trained to kind of go there and pop up and it's, well, you know, let's say it's, you know, I, I'll go with Ballyhoo, you know, if someone goes for slightly stupid's new track and happened to see Ballyhoo four or five down, I mean, and didn't hear of you, which I don't think is possible, but in that world, right? right. Uh, you never know and go, hey, there's this band I never heard of. It's Ballyhoo. And then they start to do the deep dive. Or even if it's in the shallow end dive of just the first couple tracks, right? Sure. Uh, newest, that's a beautiful thing. I think that any young band should be diving into playlists. And for Paper and Plastic, it's a constant mantra for me going, Let's see what we could get playlists. Let's let's go. Let's go after these playlists because that to me is the most important thing. And then, you know, press and all those other things, you know, fall underneath it. But playlists, number one priority, man. Uh, I think it's incredible that uh, we live in a time where, you know, we, I, I still see some artists fighting streaming in favor of CDs. I'm like, bro, that's a dead technology. Yeah, man. Um, and what do you get when you get a CD? Okay. You get artwork and you get this physical thing that the, that you can have the band sign. You're going to put it in the car on the dashboard and listen on Spotify anyway. Right. Um, <clears throat> also with a CD is you may listen to this thing a thousand times, but it does nothing for the band after that, other than you knowing the songs and possibly getting a couple of friends to come out and buy a t-shirt, which is great. That's all yeah. valuable. But if you listen to my song a thousand times on Spotify, you're helping us way more than you can imagine because yeah. of the algorithm. You know, the more action that the song gets, the more the algorithm poke. It's like it's like poking at the algorithm. It goes, oh shit, oh well, what's this? Mm, let me give this to people, the people that haven't heard the band before. The fact that you can take a link and share it with your buddy over these fucking hand crystals <laughs> and it goes up to space and back down in, in three seconds and 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 uh 
within less than a minute, you're listening to this track. I used to have to mail this to you if you lived in California. Go check it out. Let me know what you think. And a week later, you haven't listened to it. I don't know, man. I think people take it for granted. It's like, bro, you don't realize the 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 gift that you have. Yeah. You know? I, I, I agree, man. And, and you bring it up where, you know, the algorithm is a super important thing, right? And, and the more action, like you said, right, the more opportunity arises from oh. that action, right? And uh, static, you know, the sort of that static support of music, whether it be CD or whether it be LP, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't help that opportunity for a band in the streaming world. Yeah. It, it just doesn't. Right. So yeah. dude, I mean, you're, you're right on and, and you're, you're a classic example of a band that's constantly pushing forward using technology. Like we, you know, said early on and you have to be, you can't be afraid of the future, man. You have to embrace it and you have to try to like manipulate it to your advantage at the very least. You know, some people complain about the algorithm, whether it be in social media or whether it be, uh, through Spotify and the, like the digital platforms, but it just is what it is. That just means that you have to do something else. Yeah. And if you care about the numbers on social media and you care about the Spotify numbers and you should at least care about the Spotify numbers. Uh, I don't know about social media, but uh, you, you should be doing everything in your power to get there and to take the algorithm and bend it to your will. Basically. Absolutely. And that means that means uh, creating pre-save links and pushing pre-save campaigns. Fuck pre-orders. Look, you can have your your people uh, pre-order on iTunes. That's fine. I can tell you firsthand those charts don't do shit for your band. We've been number one in alternative, which is insanely hard to get. But we did it in 2017 with our, our girls' record. We did it. We sat. We we lived there all weekend. I'm watching Green Day and 21 Pilots all underneath us. We're number one for the entire weekend. That didn't do shit for the band. You know, like there was no like radio guy going, oh shit, who's this band in number one? I'm going to play them. You know, it's like, no. <clears throat> and I wasn't that concerned about it. So I just tell them like, look, man, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, whatever, streaming music is here to stay. I don't know what's going to be next, but this is it for now. And this is what works. And um, this is more of a, this is great. Fans, please continue to buy the buy the CDs and LPs from from your favorite bands at the shows and online. Uh, have them sign it, put it up on your shelf, whatever. That's this is more of a short sighted game, whereas Spotify and streaming and stuff is the long game. Yeah, man. Um, and 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 anybody who's doing this needs to be looking at the long game always. You know, never be concerned with money. Don't worry so much about the numbers. Just keep making your shit. Keep going for it. You know build your catalog make your songs make your music work for you make your videos on youtube work for you look you're gonna have song we have records that are 10 years old 20 years old that are still making us money passive income right absolutely man work has been done now they're out there you know i think people need to wrap their minds around that yeah dude i i think that there there's two musicians i've been i've been finding lately right and and one of them which is sort of just embracing the digital world for everything that's available to them. And the other artist is just stuck in this sort of time loop and is just going with that. Nothing's changed, right? Uh, we're going to go on the album cycle. We're going to go on tour. We're going to do all of this, you know, and this is going to be the world that we sort of cycle in. But there's new artists that are out there that are going uh, by any means necessary I want you to hear what I'm doing because I think it's that important that my music hits your ears. Right. And they're on there. And that, that goes to show if you even like kind of peel away, you know, SoundCloud rap, right. That they took one sort of basic idea of like a, a at the time, a, a free way to be able to put out music and for people to jump into they, they did that enough and it was popular enough that it became a genre of music. That blows me away, man. Like, and they took existing technology and they bent it to their will of, hey, you could get it free here. Go listen and go check it out. And I'm going to use every free tool that I have to get my music out there for people to listen to, for people to become fans, man. And that the power of someone listening and then becoming intrigued enough to stay and become a fan dude that blows me away man like it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful 
beautiful thing. It's incredible. Uh, you know, you know how we uh, how we Google and we uh, Xerox and we Zoom, right? Your name, you're just basically doing. You made, you made a verb from the name of the product, yeah. right? When you can create a genre of music based on the platform that it was most popular, SoundCloud rapper, and you know exactly what I'm talking about when yeah, I man. say that the style, the the way they're delivering, <clears throat> you know, it that that shows you who's winning, you know, dude, one hundred percent, man. <laughs> it's just like okay, SoundCloud, you know, that 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 mute that hip hop, that version has has won, you know, and it's it's just so rad, man. Um, I'm a uh, I'm I'm constantly blown away uh, when I when I hear about an artist that never toured a day in their life and got huge overnight, seemingly overnight. Post Malone posted he posted mm -hmm. a track and literally overnight, not like overnight, like fucking the next day, he's like exploded on on SoundCloud. And yeah, man. You know that, that's weird, but if you even peel it back and go, hey, there's bands that I know that in the '90s that didn't even have records that were touring and became bands that could be able to fill a thousand, 2000 seats in a club. And they just were on an EP. They released an EP it was before their full length and they were already, you know, going out and touring and they gained such notoriety touring that physical music was, eh, we'll get there when we get there. I, if I remember correctly, uh, creed actually funny example <laughs> um creed actually they had a manager that would like for whatever reason their music i mean that look their first record i mean i liked it it was it was like good rock music at the time yeah. then it just kind of hammered at home and got cheesy with it but um they're an example of they just would tour and people just fell in love and just they just gather people in droves yeah. now you know how hard it is to go out there and tour for years and just slowly collect and build a fan base there are some bands like that that can just just scoop them up by the truckload yeah and man. every time you come back there's 300 then there's 700 then there's 1500 and all of a sudden you're in an amphitheater you know and then there's platinum record sales whatever that means anymore but um you know that 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 always amazed me too uh the the certain bands that could just go out one time and just all of a sudden next time they're out they're just you know you know what it, there's a band i don't know they were on drive through records and it was probably maybe if you're paying attention to drive through records and like that that late uh 90s uh early 2000s but there was a band called steel train okay and uh jack went on to fun and then bleachers right, oh, right yeah yeah uh but steel train was uh, a quintessential band that was great live and every time they would come back, there'd be more people and there'd be more people Then they were, you know, co-headlining amphitheater in Florida man. like, and before they broke up, obviously. But at, at that point you go, I can't even believe like, and the records were good, but uh, you know, I, I, I listened to it and go, okay, this is good. But live is where they shine, man. And people would just come because they heard it was a great band, you know, and Frank Turner, classic example again, like road dog, but is so exciting live that it would just generate more people and more people every time he came through. And it's just a success story of an artist being, you know, that electric, that magnetism live that people just wanted to see it every time that he came, not skipping like, Oh, it's a Wednesday night. I can't make it. It's Oh shit. Frank Turner's here on a Monday night. I'm going to be there with my boys and we're going to drink. And we're going to sing. And until next time he comes through, it doesn't matter what day we'll be there. Yeah. I always thought of pepper like that, dude. Absolutely. they they turn their shows into a, it's a fucking party when yeah. those guys play. And especially in the early days, you know, mid, mid to late two thousands. Um, it was like, they just started picking up fans and droves. Those guys have so much charisma on stage. Yeah. Brett is a great front man. Brett is like, he knows the right things to say. And I've told him this many times. I'm like, bro, you're like, you know, the right things to say. I sound like a fucking idiot when I talk, when I talk between the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and you guys like as less than Jake, like, I mean, Roger and Chris had the best banter. Yeah. Like, they, unmatched. 
it was it, you guys in Blick 182. You know what I mean? For banter. To Chris and Raj, a classic banter back and forth. Uh, Chris like honed his like sort of like fat mic ish skill, right? Like that, like kind of like delivery. And it was beautiful, man. But I agree with Pepper too, man. Like that's a classic example of a three piece, and each one of the guys brings something to the stage and makes people just want to like it, man, and, yeah. and want to go all in. They all have and star power. All of them have the X factor, my friend. Yeah. It's, 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 it's very fun to watch. Um, so I, I love that. Um, so <clears throat> with, uh, I, can we get into the lesson Jake stuff and what, what, whatever you want, man? Yeah. Uh, so what was the, okay. You guys started what? 92. Yeah. 92. Yeah. You guys, just, they just had that. Um, I, I caught the, you left the band two, three years ago. Two, two years, two years ago. ago. Okay, yeah, because I caught the band last year. We were in Kansas City, and uh, they happened to be playing the same night as us. And I, well, I got over to see the show before our show, and it was like the uh, uh, oh, fuck was it twenty fifth anniversary or something like that, or uh, something like that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> uh, man, that's a long time to be in the game. Yeah, man, I, it was uh, twenty twenty seven years uh, that. Uh, I did less than Jake. And then it was just a, one of those moments, man. I had uh, a foot injury earlier in the year and that had me like physically and mentally just kind of like, you know, circling the drain. But at that same time, uh, my daughter was seven at the time. Uh, I just started to kind of realize, man, like want to be around for those things to celebrate, but I also want to be around for those things that are, are, sad too man right like you want to be around for those moments and it's hard for musicians sometimes to go you have allegiance to the thing that you love and you have allegiance to the people that you love right and some people can do a really good balance of both and i did a balance for 27 years of 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 personal life and then of band life and i i would wake up and thinking about less than Jake and I would go to sleep thinking about less than Jake and, and what to do and how to do it. But it came to a point where it was just uh, through the injury and just thinking about what the future is, right. That I just went Tor touring's not for me, man. Like, and it, it didn't mean, and still doesn't mean that I don't love less than Jake and love everything about it and love the songs and have passion. But I just, needed to make that move man like you had like in my mind i had to make that move and uh, to go uh you know five years from now when my daughter is a teenager you know and to go yeah like we knew each other uh full time like not part-time right and and uh, i and like i said some people and i don't fault people who can actually i'm jealous of people who can balance both Right. Uh, but I felt uh, that my, I was consumed by one more than the other. And I needed to balance and recalibrate what, what I was doing. And not only that, on top of all of that, it's just wanted to do more. Right. Like I, I have a tattoo shop that's in Gainesville and I do, you know, release music through paper and plastic, but I wanted to write a book and I wanted to uh, just do more and more projects. And, when you're getting older, the time has to come from somewhere, man. Like it doesn't reproduce at will when it is like, it feels like when you're young, like, Oh, I'll just pull an all nighter and get everything done. It, it doesn't work like that when you're out, you're cruising into your late forties. Just doesn't. Right. So you kind of <clears throat> felt like maybe you felt like you were married to the band and dating your family, you know, a little bit like that, man, you know, it, it's a good way and of, of saying it. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that it just, there was a point where I was just felt like I was circling and, and I, I needed to recalibrate and, and break away from the circle. I mean, you can't be mad at that, man. I, I, you know, I, I got to have respect for that. That's, you know, being able to uh, be self-aware and just sort of realize what was happening. Because, <clears throat> you know, do, do you find that if you would continue down, you know, doing touring and things like that with the band, that you would have grown to resent it? 
I, I don't know if I would have grown to resent it as much as I think that like my physical and mental health would have have deteriorated more. Right. And when you're playing when you're playing upbeat music and the show's a party, like and to feel that you're not connecting in that happiness, right? So it's a drag, man, and it almost is acts like an anchor. Yeah. You know, that everybody's having fun around you, but you're not having fun. You you know, you're uh just kind of stuck in your own head at the time of hey, I want to do this, but again, like I had broke my foot and I had tore some ligaments uh, and it just was putting a tax on me physically, which was putting a tax on me mentally. And then that the, just everything else tied into it. And it just, I knew there was a moment of, I have to break the cycle of feeling this way. And, and unfortunately I, I had to go, okay. Like I, I spent 27 great years on tour. I have to hang up touring it's unhealthy you know and uh it wasn't because i was you know uh indulging too much it wasn't because of anything like that it was just that i felt the love of everything else kind of being drained because of being gone and physically being drained and mentally being drained uh touring i, I just had to go touring's not possible <clears throat> yeah I, I definitely, you know, I got two kids myself and, uh, my son just turned 10 this year. Uh, my daughter just turned six and it's definitely, uh, it takes a toll on you on your heart and like <laughs> mentally, you know, obviously, but I definitely miss some things, you know, uh, the, when they're young, when they're super young, when they're babies, I mean, every month they're doing something different yeah, man. and new and like, you want to be there for that. I mean, I, my son was born. And three weeks later, I left for tour. You know, it was like, you know, and back then we had to be on tour. We had, cause that's the only way we made money, you know? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't much money. Um, and this is 2010, uh, when he was born. And so, uh, yeah, I, I know what it's like. I've, I've never missed a birthday. Um, I've tried not to miss dance recitals, you know, yeah, man. that kind of important stuff. Uh, I always make sure like, and my brother as well, he's got a boy. Um, we always try to schedule around those types of things yeah. um, because of, the kids didn't sign up for this. Um, and there was a point where I was, you know, before the kids where it was like, nothing matters. I love being on tour, you know, and, and then that changes, you know, you, you have to, you have to, you got to get over yourself and, um, and, and yeah, so it definitely takes a toll on your mind and, and your heart. And you're just like, God damn, I, I gotta be around more. You know, and and now look, I've been home. This is the longest I've ever, I've ever been home since yeah, my man. kids. You know, we haven't toured for almost five months. It's wild. Um, yeah. <laughs> my last my last show was March first. You know, it's wild. Yeah, and uh, and by the looks of it, it's going to be probably a year of not touring. You know. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, twenty twenty is shot for touring. It's, there's no way that's going to happen. So. Uh, spring summer 2021 probably somewhere around that that's what i'm thinking man and uh you know that's why i think that like bands need to be taking advantage of this live stream and uh doing quarantine videos like goldfinger did and like what we did like i'm, I'm still making them i just we took a break but um <clears throat> you know you gotta you gotta keep feeding the fans like to, for me like um it, my, my band i still feel like we're a band that that needs to climb the ladder we're not we're not where we want to be yet and and who knows when when that will be but i i know that there's things that we got to do to stay in touch and stay engaged and, and to keep growing and and the people that have given us love all these years and that have bought the merch and tuned in and listened to the records we owe this to them we owe it to them to not stop and and i feel like uh for us to not do anything is like a diss you know and it yeah. feels like maybe we don't love it as much as we're supposed to, as we, as we think we do or say we do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you have to uh, give back to the people that are passionate about what you do, man. And uh, in times like this, music is the, the great, like, you know, foundation for you to stand on and, and still stand, right? 
it brings happiness, man. And, and but not only that, you become bands become soundtracks to moments, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, people allow bands into their lives for those moments, the good, the bad, whatever, right? Like, and uh, bands have the honor uh, of of being able to be that soundtrack and be a part. Uh, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, you have to give back. You have to give back to the people that constantly give to you, you know, and, and now's the time where you see people who are doing that or people that have checked out and went, I'll catch you after the pandemic, you know, and, and, and disappear. Uh, and uh, it, it's a very, it's a very cool time for music in general, man. Like, I think that like with Spotify and with Apple music and whatever way that you're sort of digesting music, it's at your fingertips now, man. Like, Oh, I want to hear Steely Dan. Cool. Check it out. Like that was a favorite song. One of the favorite songs from your parents. Oh, you check it out. Right. It's right there. Yep. Uh, oh, you want to hear a new track from so-and-so, or you want to get discovery underneath, you know, Bally, who's your favorite band. And underneath there's a list of other bands for you to check out that they're the algorithm is suggesting dude, all it is a, a click away and you're in another world, man, somebody else's world. And you're in another soundtrack to like float through your life, be there for when you're sad and for happy. And dude, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing to be a listener of music right now. You raise a, a great point. Like what a, what a magical time for the musically adventurous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, a, I kind of stick to the stuff that I know and every now and then I'll find a band, but like for people that just love discovering music and just taking it in, what a wonderful model, you know, just like, Oh, look at that. Who's this? Oh, cool. Let me click that. Love it. You know? And then and you just keep going down the rabbit hole. Dude, that's what I do. I, 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 I look and I'm online and people are like, Oh, I, I, I found this band. I found that. And I like make little notes for it. And then I go in and make for that week. Uh, it starts Saturday, usually over coffee. I make a Friday release of things that I've never even heard of. I make a playlist of all that stuff. And some of it's great. And some of it's just like, eh, it's a miss for me. But man, like the Illuminati hotties. That was the last <laughs> week uh, of release. And I put it onto a playlist. And it's just really like cool kind of... Uh, vintage sounding punk but mixed with a little bit more uh modern indie rock and damn like it, it was great and uh i i like that man i like hearing other things that i've never heard of because it inspires me you know whether on the lyric or musically or just ideas like i i get fulfilled man from from new the new and it, it jars something in my brain and it sends me off in another direction. That's cool. I love that, man. Um, <clears throat> tell me about the book. Well, 619. Uh, so I'll go back. Uh, last year, uh, right at the new year of 2019, I started to write a novel. And I was probably about 120, 130 pages in. And all of a sudden, this moment of fear came over me do people even want to read what I'm, I'm writing? Like, are people interested in me beyond the lyric of less than Jake? Like, do, do they, are they going to engage with what I'm doing care? Like, I, I don't know. And it, it, I was coming from a place of fear while I was doing it. And I just decided I'm going to put this down. And, uh, it was May, the end of May. I said, I, I got to really kind of like come back on this, but I don't know how. So, I decided that in June, uh, every day I would write a short story. So starting June 1st, I would write a short story. And it, it reads a little bit more like a, a memoir and kind of beat poetry a little bit, right? Uh, there's a lot of lyrical bounce that goes with it. But every day, last summer in June, I wrote a story, you know? And so there's 30 short stories cool. and the obvious name, 619. So, you know, June... 2019 represents my creative outlook, uh, my creative output and my personal outlook for that month. So there's some skull art that I did that's in the book that I did during that month, each story that's in there. And a lot of it, you know, when I describe even the writing for the novel and I started finishing up the novel, I should be done in October, but 
uh, for me, I think that uh, it's very looking into the past. It's kind of uh, doing the look to the future as well of what it could be. And then it's making amends of what the present is. So there's a lot going on, but uh, it's a quick read. And I did that on purpose. I wanted uh, the stories, the, the person reading the stories for it to be around that like four to six minute mark. And because of the lyricalness of it, I wanted them to digest it as like a longer song. So when they read it, they get this idea. It's a quick read uh, for each one of the, the short stories. And I, they could put it down when they want to put it down. It's not this gigantic commitment, but you could get a vibe of how I am as a writer outside the lyrical content of what I've done in the past. It was a good exercise, man, and I'm proud of it, but I'm also, it energized me to jump in and finish the long form, man. And like, I'm over 200 and 230 something pages right now. And, uh, I'm going to finish it. It'll probably hit the 300 mark uh, when it's all done before it's edited, the first round of edits. And man, it, it felt good to, to get something under my belt. And it feels good for people to read it and now be excited for something that's coming in the future. You get me pumped about oh, this. Right on, man. <laughs> I love it, man. I, lo I love doing this show, man, because the, just this kind of stuff. When I talk to people um, that I don't talk to on the reg, man, it's like, you're telling me your story about writing a book and like, like I've been thinking about writing a book. I kind of started to a couple of years ago, got a couple of pages in and I just forgot about it. And I was talking to a friend over the weekend about it and he's writing a couple of books, like kind of like a business networking type book. Oh yeah. And uh, it got me pumped. And now this it's, uh, I feel like that's the next thing when you say edit. Yeah. So are you going to have somebody actually look this thing over and actually have an editor? 100%. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't have uh well, take that back. I had friends edit for me on 619 and just to look for like misspellings and punctuations and misfires of sort of the stream of consciousness writing. Right. Right. Uh, but when you're talking about 300 plus uh, pages with a story arc and characters, uh, I, you, I need a professional to come in and, and really take an, uh, a critical eye on the arc and, and make it happen. You know, uh, the tentative title is God Forgot About New Jersey. And uh, it's about basically autobiographical about me and my brother uh, growing up in the shadow of New York City uh, during when uh, metal, heavy metal music was popular uh, in the 80s. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's a cool, fun thing. And it, it's uh, when my mom and dad had just got divorced. And so she was a single mom to me and my brother. And it takes place in uh the summer of 1984. wow that's really cool man I fun. Love it, it, it's dude it's a it's a it, 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 it's been fun to write and it's been fun to kind of explore the 80s yeah and, and the headspace of so uh it's been cool man that's uh, so neat man i love i love that i love getting nostalgic and um <clears throat> i i try to like I, I saw a video recently my aunt sent me a video of um a 1988 picnic or whatever outside of my grandparents house so my brother and i are like six seven years old and we're in the video and like our parents are there and they're like 30 and it's like the weirdest yeah. thing <laughs> um, and, and uh and so i started thinking about like you know this is 88 so what was going on around this time and it had to be like it's not dated but it had to be like april may because i still had a broken arm and i did that in march yeah. so I don't know how long a cast is supposed to stay on eight weeks maybe um and so I'm like, wow, my, my mom's dad had just passed away like two months before this. And my parents got separated five months after this. Like all these things started going through my head, you know, like, wow, the eighties were a crazy time, you know, yeah, man. music. I was, I was listening to, you know, Motley Crue, you know, yeah. and, and rat and poison and shit in, in 88, you know, and, and waiting for Dr. Feelgood to come out, like stuff like that. Totally, <clears throat> So that's very cool. You got to, you got to kind of go down that memory lane a little bit. A absolutely, man. And, and, you know, you open it up sometimes to uh, you have to make it a little bit fiction in there because uh, you're filling in gaps that for editorial speaking, right? Sure. Like uh, you're filling in gaps and story arc, uh, you're filling in some gaps, but uh, 
it's it's based you know based on mm-hmm. you know my <clears throat> one summer uh, during the eighties with my mom being a single mom and uh, sort of heavy metal being king uh, for the summertime and oh, yeah. uh, it's just you know it's just a, it's uh, it's been a wild ride but. You know, again, like I, I jumped in when I stopped touring, I jumped into a lot of creative work. So it was, you know, the the novel and then it went into 619. And then after that, it started to assemble uh, the Inevitables world. Right. And the Inevitables, uh, people get to hear it and see it starting Monday because uh, that's when the Kickstarter launches. Right. Uh, and we've been teasing and putting up characters and putting up like a little bit of a song on social media just to get people aware of it. Uh, but it's been a really well-kept secret since November of, of putting it together and putting players together in it and just writing songs with, you know, because me and Chris and Raj and buddy JR, uh, we've been writing forever. So a chance to write with uh, Obi and uh, Alex was dude. Like uh, another another planet, man. Like I landed on another planet. Like writing partners, but we're they're coming from a whole another reference space that I come. So before, if I went to Chris, no, we we should have the snuff part. You know, he would understand. Oh yeah, snuff the band England and this part that goes long, cool. Uh, but I'm going to Alex. No, the snuff part. But hey, here's the reference of what I'm talking about, and like kind of check out what I mean to it, right? And uh, it and sort of primarily uh, it floats between ska, reggae, and ska punk in genre. So I'm having gonna... those having those players, right? And just dude, it's so big and so cool, and I, I can't wait for people to hear the track, the first one coming out called Fort Lauderdale. And you're playing it or have played it, you know, already, but or will play it wherever you drop it in. Near. And I'm excited for people to listen to it, man, because it's a big song with, with great players and it just exciting. And I played it for a friend, and his main thing was I would never have guessed it would sound like this. I figured the next musical thing would have been harder than Less Than Jake, but it's more ska and and a little bit lighter than than the lesson jake world and wow. so fun i can't wait to hear it man fun man it's fun. Oh, i love that you're doing a you're releasing a comic book with this you said? We, we are releasing a comic book so the world of the inevitables is not only uh the music side but the music side provides a soundtrack to the comic and the world that we're sort of putting together and uh the comic the comic has been cool we brought in uh, Jonathan Diener to write the script for it. And he uh, was in this band called the Swellers uh, mm-hmm. for a long time, played drums, but he started doing comic books uh, and scripting uh, the last few years. So we brought him in that musical connection to uh, that world uh, made it easy to communicate and understand. Uh, so he did that. Uh, Liana uh, Kangas is doing the art for it. And she's done a lot of stuff for Black Mask and Sci-Fi Network. And uh, she's a person that uh, has an increasing sort of name in the comic book world. So it's good to work with somebody that sort of is just at the cusp of her fucking game, man. Like, you know, and uh, ultimately speaking, we're we're eyeing more of a uh, try to get it into the TV show world pilot of things uh so we're starting here though uh and the world is a cool world uh to be able to sink into and it's not a superhero world even though they're acting like superheroes but it's a mishmash uh group of characters that are trying to save the world from ending in 40 days and a drug dealer from fort lauderdale and a graffiti artist from the Everglades and uh, two uh, uh, a husband and a wife evangelical Christian uh, people that are into dominatrix and s m you know and it's just uh, not to give it all up but uh, it was a fun world to construct it's brightly colored and but uh, 
circles around kind of uh, weird and ugly things, but very brightly colored as well. So you're, it's a ska punk opera. That's what you're telling me. It, it is. Uh, it, if you want to call a ska punk opera, you know, I, I'd, I'd happy to have that uh, hung around my neck and, and walk around with. I love that. It's, it, I love how it's like a, there's characters and it's all thought out and there's this whole arc. It's there, very there, cool. Man. Dude, it's all, it's all, it's all there, man. And I'm, I'm excited just because it all came from a base of an idea of there's things in this world that are inevitable, right? And the end is inevitable, man. Like there's, there's nothing that, that in the human world goes on forever. You end, I end, you know, and there's ha happiness is inevitable, man. You're at some point in your life are going to be happy and going to be sad, you know? And like that to me intrigued me that no matter how hard you try, there's some things that are going to happen no matter what. And that was the beginning, like sort of, spark of what it is man it's the inevitables and uh, there's little pieces of uh the first one which is a lot have to do with about growing old uh no matter what man you could try but no matter what man time marches forward you're gonna get older you could try to stop it but no matter what man someone's coming in and time marches on we all are getting older and that's you know the a, a crux moment of issue one Wow, that's so, it's wild, man. I'm a, I was a big fan of comic books when I was a kid, and um, art is awesome. I, I just can't wait to see all this and tie it together with with the music and stuff. I think it's really cool, and hopefully a, a show or something does develop out of this. That'd be really neat. I I, I hope so, man. So, you know, and uh, the the biggest thing for us is how to, you know, when shows come back online, whether or not we're gonna do one. We we talk briefly and kind of like uh toss around some ideas but i don't know man like we'll see how people respond you know uh, i'm hoping favorably but you, you you know you just never know you never know <clears throat> um you know we'll, we'll we'll get there and as for now it's like it, people just need to you know keep taking it online um yeah man you know just keep feeding the baby birds as, as i say true <laughs> so, uh how how are you uh releasing your books the novel well uh for 619 i did it myself and it's the same thing man where i was just like okay i want to release this so research into how to to distribute digitally mm -hmm. you know research into how to distribute to brick and mortar mm -hmm. you know and then i have the infrastructure that's already based on paper and plastic for mail order right nice. uh so you have fans that were fans before and friends and family that that knew how to get it already if you wanted a a copy you could buy it you know at paper and plastic you know at the web store uh no problem but i've been working on distribution for brick and mortar uh so it should be in at least available to order from you know books a million and things like that and then it's available at kindle and it's available in all the digital usual digital suspects that's great uh for though the actual novel uh, when it's done and when it's edited, I'm going to pitch it to other publishers and see if they respond. And if there's no response, man, I'm like, we talked the first, you know, 45 minutes of this conversation. No, I'm no stranger in doing it myself, man. And I'll do it myself. If there's no one there. Fuck the gatekeeper, dude. You don't, yeah. you, you don't need to, to, uh, kiss the feet of the gatekeeper, man. When all, they will do is put a boot against your neck in the future, you know? Yeah. They're so, going to, they're going to want money and it's all to you decide if that deal is good for you. And if it's not good, you can say no and do it yourself. 100%. My friend, I, I love the world we're living in, man. The, the, the potential to, to grow yourself. You know, the people talk about like, um, you know, America, you got to make yourself, you know, but it's like, what a better, you know, no better time than now to, to start making yourself. Did I, I agree 100%. You don't need the middleman. I love it. Um, so before we get out of here, uh, tell me about um, Fuel by Ramen, man. I, I want to know. You know what? A legendary, uh, uh, label. Yeah, man. It, it, it's funny because there was a moment that, you know, we were talking about that, you know, it screams the same, you know, where Les and Jake was on tour in the, the early 90s. And we were seeing these bands that were opening up and you're going, 
Like, do you have anything out? And they're like, well, we have our demo tape. You know, this was before CDs became really popular, right? Uh, and CDs became the new demo tape, but that's a whole nother like sort of thing, right? Uh, and I kept on coming in contact with bands that were amazing bands, but didn't have anything out. And I was like, dude, like, let me do this, you know, let me help you put out some music. And it started, you know, very eclectically in things that I liked, you know, and that was Big Wig from New Jersey, Apocalypse Hoboken. And it went started to get into as ska punk became more popular and we're running into those bands. It was the hippos and it was the Superflies from New Orleans. And, you know, you start going down that line, but as music started to change, it became other things, you know, and uh, around like the, the second year uh, I brought in uh, a friend that was John Janik. Right. And he became mm -hmm. partners with me and John uh, very music business minded, right. All about the business end of it. And that to me, I always go into that. It be, me and him were a great yin and yang, right. Where, I was on tour and I was finding bands, but I had this like sort of like spot of like business and that shining moment. And he was a lot about the music business and had that like, like, you know, spot and shining moment of that passion for music and, and, and discovering music. And it was just this perfect yin and yang, man, that like started to increase a little bit more and a little bit more. And just that same story that we had of that band that would come back and there'd be 300 people and then 600 people and a thousand people. That's what Feel by Ramen was doing with each one of our releases was increasing, increasing, increasing. And as the music playing field started to shift in style, so did Feel by Ramen, you know, and that turned into Fallout Boy and the, the three signings at one time couldn't be more different it was fallout boy these arms are snakes which had a guy from botching it and then things like that uh and then uh uh the akas are everywhere from philly which was like the hives okay and dude it was it was very very wild at the moment man like, and it was man it was very eclectic at the time but we had a good base of uh Rory from the Impossibles and Jamie from Animal Chin, uh, two ska punk bands, but they had started another band called The Stereo, and it was just another extremely great band. But it's it made the base of the label continue, and then we brought on Amberetta uh, from Richmond, which had a really good following at the time, and it just again started to build and build and build and build, and. Uh, it wound up, man, where we, when we got the, the deal with WIA, which is the Warner Brothers arm of, of distribution, yeah. uh, the gatekeeper, so the to gatekeeper. speak, right? Yeah. Uh, that it really exploded. Wow. So, so they were like the, uh, the, the major distributor, you'd say? Or oh, yeah. Ma 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 major label they, distribution, they 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's awesome. I remember I remember back in the day, like trying to get noticed by uh, Fuel by Ramen, but I didn't know how. <laughs> it's like yeah. uh, mid two thousands, I think. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Because there's a point where uh, people, you know, didn't want to approach the wall garden, right? And then there were some motherfuckers who, you know, would scale that shit, make a jetpack out of gasoline, man, and try to fly over the wall. And those are the people that get noticed and are like, who the hell are you? Like, what are you doing? Like, and, 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 and that, those were the cool moments. And then there's other people who went, I have no idea how to approach. That was me. You know, and, and now go back and, and make this like the 360 conversation. Now there's no world garden anymore, man. If you want to have your music out and distributed and available on iTunes and Spotify and Deezer and go down the line, you can do that. You could do that from the comfort of your living room. It's awesome. Where to, so what do you think about, I mean, you have uh, paper and plastic now. As far as the label is concerned and signing other artists, where are you on that? Are you? I, I, do, I do things that I'm very passionate about. Yeah. So if I'm passionate, let's say with the next release, 
is after the fall and they do kind of a melodic hardcore uh escape punk vibe to it uh i i love their band i love their songs i love mike who who sings and uh plays guitar and uh it's a passionate thing for me to want to release the music right mm -hmm. uh i think that with paper and plastic it's divided now between releasing things i truly love mm -hmm. and dude uh, that's an eclectic mix everything from like crazy death metal to light pop music to uh you know skate punk melodic hardcore uh i i do that but i also do toys like resin toys and production piece toys i do art and i do prints uh those are you know i wanted something that uh was a very wide umbrella that i could do a ton of things with and uh I've been achieving that, you know, and people go, don't you, don't, don't you want this? Aren't you hungrier for a success of like wanting to break a band? Yeah, that would be good. That would be great. But I, first and foremost, it has to be something that I truly love. That makes total sense. <clears throat> we, uh, we have our own label. Um, we started our label in 2013 and I, I'd always wanted to be, I always wanted to run a label and sign bands and help and things like that. Um, so we released a couple bands. Uh, Bump and Uglies is one of them. Uh, Resonate is another one. Um, and uh, we, I kind of got to a point where I felt like we might not be able to help a lot of bands anymore because uh, because of streaming and and free distribution. You know, yeah. and I feel like you know, and unless we have a significant amount of money to help them record or you know or be able to put them on tour. And and kind of give the, give them some some looks because of that. What else do we have to offer? You know, it's like what do we, you know, you can do it yourself. You know, it's just how it's one way is going to take a little longer to get noticed or whatever. But so I kind of the wind got taken out of my sails a little bit. We still put everything out on our own label, but uh, as far as approaching other bands or responding to bands that that are like, hey, we would love for you to sign us, I kind of just don't entertain it anymore. You know, I I entertain it because if I feel that I could come in under the that sort of umbrella of a pseudo manager, right? Saying, hey, we should make this game plan. Hey, we should do these steps. This is what you should do. I always considered, and even when I started Paper and Plastic up to now, I always considered Paper and Plastic a middle ground between doing it yourself and then being on a larger label. It was this conduit to get to a larger label. I always thought about it like that. I never like had any preconceived, like I'm going to break this and it's going to be huge. I just got off on helping smaller bands mm -hmm. navigating and getting to a bigger, not necessarily better place, but a bigger place if they so desired. Yeah, that, that was pretty much the mentality. I mean, you can't have any uh illusions of like oh i'm gonna make your band huge i was just interested in helping them step up you know be a springboard in a yeah, way man. and I and, I, and i just i guess the last several years because of how everything's playing out with distribution and all you can go to distro kid or cd baby or whatever is that um you know if i don't feel like i can i can really help in a major way and bring a lot of value bring enough value I don't want to charge anybody. I don't want to take 50% of their record or whatever it is, or, um, you know, however it works out. But, um, so I, like I said, it just sort of, I don't know I've been less happy or, or less stoked about releasing bands. I still would like to in some capacity. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll figure it out at some point. So I, yeah. I was wondering what your thoughts were. Yeah, on that. man, it, it's all for me, it's all fluid and I'm just trying to take, the experiences that I have and helping younger bands, man, like, and that, and that's, you know, weirdly part psychological and, and part, you know, uh, campaign manager, so to speak, right? Like, you know, you're going, Hey, we should do this and this and this, and, uh, we should do X, Y, Z, but you know, you're teaching some lessons along the way and, you're getting them set up to be a career artist, man, if that's what they want, right? Uh, 
and I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I think that it's so easy to do yourself that uh, unless you're bringing that uh, headspace of marketing and and for all, for all intents and purposes, it's marketing and it's just general guidance, man. Unless you can bring that to a band, there's no reason to put out their record. Yeah, that's that's where I sit with it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so wrapping up here. Uh, so the inevitable's new track is gonna be is gonna be out when when this is uh this podcast is out. Yeah, the song's called Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale, right on. Um, so we're gonna play it here at the end of the show. Um, if you're listening right now, uh, and um, and then which is gonna be the future for us. So yeah, man. Um, but uh, so tell everybody where they can find you and the band and any projects you you're working on the books and all that. Uh, you could find me. Uh, I primarily post on Instagram, and you could find me at Wonderland War, which is a U W U N D E R L A N D W A R. Uh, you could find uh, any books that I do and any paper and plastic releases that I do uh, at uh, paperandplastic.limitedrun.com, which is the web store for you to check out. Uh, the Inevitables you could find uh, on Instagram at We Are The Inevitables, and you can go to theinevitables.world to go sign up for our uh, newsletter and kind of check out what's going on. Uh, the Kickstarter link will be there starting on Monday if you so desire to check out the campaign of what we're doing. Also, check out the song. We'll be living there as well for a few weeks and only there uh so other than that man uh that covers it awesome we'll um <clears throat> stick around here after we're done i'm gonna get some links from you some some info and uh, i'll make sure to have that stuff posted here at the bottom uh the description in the, in the podcast and then the youtube um Vinny, thanks so much for coming on man it's thanks it's for been, having me man it's been great hearing about your career man it's been a what you you've accomplished a lot of stuff and i love that you just keep going uh you're a true artist you know, Thanks, man. And you're just it. driven. And I love that, man. So, so thank you very much for the inspiration. And I hope everybody here listening and watching got the inspiration as well. Thanks I, I should be ready to write my book, man. <laughs> Dude, you got to do it, man. <laughs> yeah, man. <clears throat> all right. I'm going to run the outro. Stick around. All right. Right on, man. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Tales from the Green Room. I'm Howie Spangler. Uh, make sure you follow on YouTube. And if you're watching on uh, Facebook, please share it around. Uh, subscribe to the, uh, the, the podcast over on, at Apple and Spotify. And uh, don't forget, as always, check out the band Ballyhoo and all my stuff, HowieSpangler.com, and find me on Instagram and all that fun shit. All right, well, I'll talk to you soon, everybody. Keep rocking. All right, man.